All right, good morning. It is so good to see all these beautiful faces. Um, <clears throat> we're going to start our morning uh, song service with Nothing But the Blood, page 337. Amen. of Jesus, we would have no hope, but we have great hope because of him dying on the cross for our sins. Woo! We're here to celebrate that this morning. I'm glad you're here today. It is beautiful outside today, nice and cool. I said, man, we should pull out the lawn chairs and tailgates and head outdoor church. Uh, but we're going to have church. I'm going to hear us out there this morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you would, take your bulletins out. Got a few updates on our prayer list. I want our church family to be aware of. Um, Meemaw, my mother-in-law, Sandra, uh, goes back to the doctor on the 1st uh, to get her foot checked out to see if uh, she's progressing nicely or if um, she needs maybe be required to have surgery. Um, she says she's kind of doing what the doctor tells her, so we'll see what kind of report she gets when she goes to see him on the 1st. Um, continue to pray for Mark Rayburn. Uh, they're getting down to having to make some pretty tough decisions about amputation and other things. Um, pray for his, his Angela and his kids. Um, just pray that... Uh, we just pray that God will heal him um, and that, that the circulation will be restored to his hands and his kidneys. And uh, he just, he needs a miracle. Uh, but we serve a miracle working God. Just pray that God will just overwhelm him with grace in the midst of it all. Uh, continue to pray for Trish. She has her foot surgery scheduled for June the 2nd. Um, see how good she does with following directions when she's done. <laughs> so I can call her out from up here. I'm in trouble when I get I'm done. Say. Woo, man, preacher, you get in trouble already. Um, and uh, continue to pray for Mr. Billy. He's, uh, he went back to the doctor last week, and they said he did have pneumonia. Um, still not doing real well. Um, got some sores in his mouth and um, not eating very much. Uh, and he needs to eat. Um, so he's, uh, he, he's, what was that movie where he said he's a little thin under the skin? So, but just to be in prayer for Mr. Billy and Miss Evelyn. Uh, Chelsea still hadn't had her baby, so that's going to be coming any day now. I think the, she, the baby's holding out to be born on Thomas's birthday on the 23rd. We'll see how that works out. <laughs> so Papa would hate that, you know. But um, do be in prayer for her. Talked to her yesterday, and everything's just progressing along, and she's, uh, she's feeling good. The baby's in there doing somersaults, so uh, be here before we know it. Uh, continue to pray for David. Uh, he's healing from his uh, hernia surgery um, and is uh, <coughs> getting stronger, but still not 100%. So... Uh, he told me, he texted me this week, he told me something interesting. He said, um, I'm, I'm still not ready to go yet. He said, man, but I'm ready to be fed. He, he misses being here. Tell everybody I miss him and we're ready to be back in church. And I thought, wow, 
What an awesome testimony that is. Uh, Nikki Youngblood, he's walking up to a mile without his walker since his back surgery. And uh, Glenda said she didn't lose his, her mind or her sanity in the process. So we, we claim that as a double blessing there. Uh, he's doing good, so just continue to pray for him. And be in prayer for the Maldonado family. Uh, Anthony passed away about a week ago. I think his services were Tuesday. Um, but just a tough time for that family as Miranda is still battling cancer herself. Pray for the kids. Uh, be a tough, tough transition for them, um, losing their dad. And with them still being young in age and all, um, I can't imagine. So um, got a couple of others here. Uh, Myra, tonsils. Pray those continue to get stronger. Zach, uh, gra I didn't mention it last week. Zachary graduated last Friday from A&M, so he is through with college. Good job, buddy. Huh? And I'm, I'm very proud of you. Uh, now, we're, now we're on the job hunt, so uh, be in prayer for him as well. Um, so many others. Tori Demint's having her surgery this week. They're going to remove the lymph nodes in her neck. Uh, my dad, uh, they're holding off on some of his radiation treatments, may not need this many of them and may not need them till later. So uh, continue to pray for, for him. Um, and Mary Kelly, she's on a road trip with her aunt, 88-year-old aunt. So uh, just a lot of things going on, a lot of people that just need a touch from the Lord this week. So be faithful to pray for them. Be faithful to remember them and to lift them before the Father. As far as announcements, my good buddy Tom has a birthday on the 23rd, 50... Three spring chicken. So uh, happy birthday to you. And then uh, don't forget on Wednesdays, our men's and women's Bible study at 6 o'clock. What a great time we're having in the Lord there. Wow. And our new materials. New materials. The ladies' new materials came in. Um, they're here. So if you want to get those, uh, get with Trish right after church. and she, they're, they're in the back of the van. Oh, okay. I put them in the car. <laughs> so, because Rachel told me to. So, <laughs> So they're here, uh, but go ahead and you can get your copy of that, and uh, we'll get started with that, their next round. Uh, men, we're going through the book of Galatians, so um, just uh, pray you'll be here and be a part of that. We're glad you're here this morning. We serve a mighty, awesome God, and uh, we're here today to celebrate Him. Let's go to Him in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just come to you this morning in the powerful name of Jesus. And God, we thank you for the privilege that we have to be in your house today, God. We thank you for the great privilege we have as your children to approach your throne of grace with boldness, Father. And God, we boldly lift each of these that we've mentioned before you today. God, we know that you're aware of their situation, and Father, I just pray that you will intervene in their lives in a supernatural way. Astound their doctors, astound their families, Father. Just do a mighty work in their lives for your glory. God, sustain them, give them comfort and strength as they've never known, Father. And God, I just pray that today as we, as we continue to worship your glorious name, that it'll be pleasing to your ears, Father. God, may we prepare our hearts to meet with you today. Thank you for this opportunity. Be glorified in it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. <clears throat> We're going to continue song service with page... 510, Heaven Came Down.
will continue singing Surely Goodness and Mercy, page 691. so much for your willingness to help okay so um great and mighty is the lord our god Mighty is the Lord our God, great and mighty is He. Mm. That's good stuff. Um, if you would please open your Bibles with me this morning to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 
I'm going to begin reading in verse 1 through verse 12 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And if you would please stand with me out of reverence to the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of the power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, ordained before the, I'm sorry, before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for they had, if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the Spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. Heavenly Father, I come to you this morning in the name of Jesus. And Father, I thank you for the incredible privilege that we have to assemble in your house today. God, I thank you for the freedom that we have because of men and women who put on a uniform and went and stood on a wall to defend the freedom that we enjoy today. God, I pray you'll bless them, bless their families today. Father, I thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. I thank you for the victory that we have because of the sacrifice your son made for us. And Father, I pray that as we look into these words that Paul wrote to the early Corinthian church, to these believers, God, that we'll be reminded that the wisdom of God is far superior to the wisdom of man. And Father, I just pray that you will empower me, embolden me to proclaim this message. God, I, do, I, I don't want the words that come out of my mouth to be my own, Father. Speak through me. Use me today for your glory. God, be glorified through the preaching of your word. Prepare every heart to hear from you today, Father. May we leave this place having met with the Almighty. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. I had a simple thought that came into my mind this week as God, I was praying about what uh, to bring you this morning, and it was this. Why do we spend so much of our time and effort believing people who are dumb compared to the wisdom of Almighty God? <laughs> the wisdom of God is far superior to the wisdom of man. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the wisdom of man is folly compared to the wisdom of God. And so, as, as the Holy Spirit led me to the book of, of Corinthians, of 1 Corinthians, we see here a letter that Paul had written to the early church at Corinth. They had had some, uh, some people that had begun to infiltrate the church uh, that were beginning to impart man, the wisdom of man into the congregation. And Paul wanted to be sure that they understood that there was nothing good that could come from that. He wanted them to know that the wisdom of man uh, it, it leads to failure and that it will eventually come to nothing. We have to be so careful and so guarded in our world today that we don't allow the worldly influences to creep into our lives and begin to uh, shape us or mold us in any way. Because we have the wisdom of God clearly portrayed in His Word, clearly given to us through the, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit that we can lean on in light of the wisdom of man. So Paul here, he wants to draw the contrast or the distinction between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of God. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the subject, the wisdom that the world needs. Um, as our world keeps continuing to spiral into chaos, the wisdom of God is the only thing that will stand. The wisdom of God is the only thing that can make something out of the mess. Uh, it, it's the only thing that is truth, and it's the only thing that will last for all eternity. And we have to be, we have to be so mindful of that and recognize the wisdom of man and be able to distinguish between the two. So Paul here, as he begins this, this letter to the church at Corinth in chapter 2, verse 1, 
He says, and I, brethren... That word and is a connective word, connecting it to the verse that is leading to it. Paul had just gotten through telling the believers in the Corinthian church what we have as followers of Jesus Christ. Look up with me in verse 30 of chapter 1. It says, but of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Those are the things that we have as followers of Jesus Christ. I have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I have been redeemed. I have been put into a right relationship with God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We sang, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. That is the only thing that can remove the stain of sin that's in our life. It's the red royal blood of Jesus Christ. And so Paul reminded them here that we have redemption through Jesus Christ. We have sanctification. I'm being continually molded into the image of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The trials that I walk through, the adversity that I face, the joys that I have, the experiences that I have in this life when I'm chasing after him are to mold me into his image. Because the, my desire as a believer should be to emulate and to look a lot like Jesus in this world. And so Paul hears him remind him, he says, that we have wisdom from God. The wisdom from God came down to this earth in the, in the flesh in the form of Jesus Christ. Everything that Jesus spoke was wisdom. Everything that he spoke was wisdom from the Father. And so anything that is contradictory to what Jesus Christ said is foolishness. It's not wisdom. And so Paul, as he reminds them of this in, verse, in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I came to you I, I, to address you, and to encourage you, he said, I did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom. Paul wanted them to know that I didn't come here with a bunch of fancy talk. I didn't come here with a message that I, that I found interesting. I didn't come here on my own accord. He said, I came here on behalf of the testimony of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, I didn't come here teaching men's wisdom. You look around church, a lot of churches today and the wisdom of man is being spewed out and, and, and sent out from pulpits all over this country. Uh, they're, they're trying to tell people how they can obtain certain things in life if they just work hard enough or if they, if they, if they do these certain steps. I saw an ad popped up on, my, on YouTube on a sermon I was watching and it was this uh, yoga master. He was this little, a little Hindu fellow and he was talking about, he was going to be having an event in Los Angeles. And they were selling tickets and wanted this huge crowd to come out. And he was talking about how people could, um, you know, people want to get to a place of peace. They can ascend the ladder to peace whenever they want if they just follow these steps. And, you know, all of these things of how they could obtain enlightenment and calm in their life if they would just do these things that he was teaching. Let me tell you what, he's a false prophet and he was teaching things that didn't honor God. Because the way that I get peace in my life is when I follow my face before a holy God. I repent of my sins and I get into sweet fellowship with my Lord and Savior. I pray to him. I talk to him. I communicate with him. I fellowship with him. And when I'm looking to him, then I have peace because the Prince of Peace is there with me. It, it doesn't come from some wisdom of men. Uh, that, uh, there are a lot of people that think they're pretty smart. But let me tell you what, they're fools compared to the wisdom of Almighty God. And so he, he, he didn't want them. He said, I didn't come to you like that. I didn't come to you with a bunch of fancy talk, with all this fancy speech, declaring to you the testimony of God. Verse 2, For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The only message that Paul came to proclaim to them was Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The only message that we have as children of God is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The only truth that we have that there is is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul said, I didn't bring any other fancy things with me. All I brought to you was the gospel and it's all that you need. The world today doesn't need more programs. We don't need more organizations. We need a Holy Ghost revival and for the power of God to fall on this nation. We need people to repent of their sins, believe the gospel, and get saved. The gospel of Jesus Christ is powerful. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because the power of God unto salvation is what the Bible says. And so here Paul says, I didn't come to you with all these things except Jesus Christ and him crucified. That is the gospel. That Jesus Christ died for my sins. Why would Jesus do that? Because he loves me. Why did he do that for you? Because he loves you. That's the message. That's the only thing we've got. And it's the only thing that we need. Um, I, every funeral I preach, I preach the gospel. Because you have a captive audience and people thinking about what happens next. You don't need to know how to, how to, you know, 
how to be successful financially, all of that. You need to know how to get to heaven. You need to know that, that, that there, there's a way to have peace in the midst of your storm, and it only comes through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so Paul said, I'm not bringing you any fancy talk. I'm preaching Jesus crucified. That is all there is. Um, look at verse 3. He said, I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. Paul said, I didn't come to you having it all together. We don't go out into the world in front of the people that God has across our path um, and try to make it look like we've got it all together. He says, I was here in fear, in weakness, because the Bible says when I'm weak, then I'm strong. People that walk around ex exuding these incredible amount of strength are usually pretty prideful, and the collapse is soon coming. He said, I was with you in fear and in weakness and in trembling. That was a reverent respect for Almighty God. And that's the way that we should approach people in the world. That's the way, that's the, the way that we should act and behave as followers of Jesus Christ. So he said, I'm not here with fancy speech. With fancy speech, I'm here bringing you the gospel, and I'm doing so from a place of humility. Because I have to understand that, you know, before I was born again, I was a lost sinner too, and my destiny was the same as everybody else's that hadn't believed in Jesus Christ. I was headed to a real place called hell <coughs> until the grace of God came and saved me. And so he, he's coming to them. He's kind of setting the stage for this is where my heart is. This is where I'm coming from. Look at verse 3. I was with you in weakness, in fear, and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom. I wasn't trying to talk you into something worldly. I wasn't trying to talk you into believing something that was from men. I wasn't here trying to, to, to sweet talk you. or to be. A, he, uh, Paul was not a very good used car salesman. He just came and he talked real plain to them. He talked real plain to people, and he said, I'm not trying to be fancy here. I'm trying to be righteous and biblical. I'm trying to teach you the truth here. He said, I didn't come in all that, but <clears throat> in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul wanted it to be evident and known that talk is cheap. He said, the reason that I'm here before you, you can see the evidence of my message in how I live it out in the power of the Spirit. You can see it lived out. Remember what Paul had been going through. He'd been arrested, shipwrecked, beaten. All these things had taken place. And as he's writing this, he's in jail. He is in jail. But he wanted them to know that you want to see what a follower of Jesus Christ looks like? We walk humbly before our God. We are overwhelmed with joy for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and here, here I'm coming to you, not trying to persuade you or slick talk you into anything, but I'm demonstrating what Jesus Christ has done in my life, and it brings great power. It brings a sense of great power. And uh, as children of God, we should not walk around defeated because we have the power of Almighty God on our side. We have the, the Holy Spirit of God living inside of us. And so here he's declaring to them, this is where I'm coming from. And he gives the reason in verse 5, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. There is the problem with our world. That is the problem with our culture. We put too much of our faith in the wisdom of men rather than in the power of God. Well, what does that look like? Well, think of the things in our world today that are popular or that we're, they try to convince us that we should believe in. Um, uh, I was sent an article by a dear friend of mine this week, and it was it, an event that took place in Sherman, Texas. That's not too far from here, north of Dallas. And... I, I wrote the details up down because I wanted to get this right because it totally, it got all over the Holy Spirit in me. It was an event called Pride Prom, a family-friendly drag show. And the thing that made it so overwhelmingly ridiculous was that it was hosted by the First United Methodist Church of Sherman, Texas. And there was a group of protesters that came together to protest at the church against what was going on inside the church. We should not have to go to church to protest wickedness within the church. But yet here they were at this pride prom. And when they asked the church why they were hosting this thing, um, here's their response. We pride ourselves on in inclusivity. We're young, we're old, married, single, gay, straight, liberal, conservative. And I read the first two words and I realized I said, that's their problem. It says, we pride ourselves. The Bible says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Mm -hmm. And here they are in a Christian church promoting this garbage. Let me tell you what. Um, mm, 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 mm. 
We shouldn't take our children to drag queen shows. We should drag our children to church. Uh, uh, they should be here every time. We don't need to let our children find themselves and find who they want to be. We need to have our kids find Jesus Christ. We need to help and enable them to do that. Uh, we, uh, we don't need to have them reading the, the My Two Moms. We need to have them reading the Word of God. Uh, because once we get into this where uh, this wisdom of men, all these things the culture wants us to be approved, approve of, it goes in the face of who God is and what He stands for. It is outright Oh, man, it's evil and wicked. And so here this is happening within a church. So what does that do to the rest of the churches? That, you know, uh, There are people that think that all, all churches must think it's okay. They're Christian. Let me tell you what, there's absolutely nothing Christian about what took place that day in that place. And, and the people that took their kids there, um, let me give you a little advice. I hope they're watching this. Uh, you are opening up your children to a portal of the demonic realm, and when you do so, don't be surprised when your kids end up depressed, when they end up not knowing who they are, when they're confused, and when they end up in misery because you've allowed that junk to enter their life. Our job as parents is to stand the wall and to defend and protect our children. We're to teach them about the things of God. The Bible says teach them as they rise up. When we're walking down the road, we put them down to bed. And that's where the problems come in. People have quit taking their, their, their roles and responsibilities of being the godly men and women God's called us to be, and now generations are suffering because of it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you what, the wisdom of men will fail. The wisdom of men will fail. I don't care what the culture thinks. I care what God says. I'm not trying to get the approval of the alphabet army. I'm trying to get the approval of Almighty God. Mm -hmm. That's not going to save me, but that sure does show him that I appreciate what he did for me. And so here we see all these things happening. And Paul didn't want that happening to the Corinthian church. He says that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. We limit God. When we step outside of him and we begin to, to chase after and pursue after things that don't honor him, we take the power of God right out of our life. How can we expect God to bless us and do incredible works in our life and in the lives of our families when we're not honoring him with those lives? We can't. And Paul didn't want the Corinthian church to keep falling further and further away from God because of it. Now, the wisdom of men, a lot of times it sounds good. The, the, the enemy is the great deceiver. He can make all of this look good. But God loves people. Well, of course he loves people. But you know what? God hates sin. God loves the sinner. He hates the sin. And so we see here that, that Paul didn't want them to get off track with this. What other things does the wisdom of men look like? Well... We try to come up with these organizations that are filled with wickedness. And we think that somehow they're going to solve the world's problems. The World Economic Forum. Let me tell you what, if born-again believers, if people start handling their money the way the Bible tells us to, we won't have financial issues to deal with. Uh, when we get a, if we were to have a government that did the same, uh, the America wouldn't be in trouble. We wouldn't be about to default on our debt, all that kind of mess. Because we'd be honoring God in that financial area. We wouldn't need all that stuff. We wouldn't need a new world order. We sure wouldn't need DEI. That's my favorite. All that, uh, uh, what is it, diversity, equity, and inclusion. You see it everywhere you go. DEI scores. Let me tell you what. If you want DEI, read the Bible. Uh, the Bible says, the Revelation 7, 9, whew, there will be a great multitude from every nation, tribe, and tongue around the throne of God. That sounds pretty diverse to me. That, 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 there's going to be pretty diverse to me. Uh, you want uh, equity? How about all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? How about there's no one righteous? No, not one. We're all in that same boat. Well, if you want equity, we're all the same. We're all equal at the foot of the cross. We're all a bunch of sinners that need a Savior. But then you get to the inclusion. The Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Bible says that anyone who comes into me, I will in no wise cast out. There's some inclusion for you. The worldly wisdom, they have it all wrong. They think that we're intolerant, that we're bigots, that we're all these things because we stand for the truths of God when really we're all about the message that they really think they're all about. So we, we need to stand firm on those things and not allow them put our faith in the wisdom of men but in the power of God. There's nothing my God cannot do. Nothing. And so Paul, he's, he's encouraging there. Look at verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 6. He says, However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not this wisdom of this age. So Paul wanted to go on and say, these were all new Christians. He said, now there's a time uh, to, to speak the wisdom of God to mature Christians because there's certain things that mature Christians that have been walking with the Lord in their faith can take in. 
Uh, the Holy Spirit reveals things to us on a, on a kind of a gradual as we need to know basis. And the more that we walk with God, the more that we chase after Him, the deeper that relationship gets. The more, the more of God's character He can reveal to us in our lives. You know, He gives us that truth as we can handle it. And so Paul here says, there is a time for the wisdom of God of this age. But he says, um, not of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. I read that and I went, woo! Man, I got excited to think about all of the Democrats, all of the Al alphabet army, all of that mess and wickedness that doesn't honor God. It will all come to nothing because there's coming a day when every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You can count on it. The Bible says it's going to happen. Amen. And so we see here that, that Paul wanted to know this, all this wisdom, all this worldly junk everybody's getting caught up in, it will come to nothing. It will not be successful. It will not stand in the face of Almighty God. And so he, he's declaring to them that. He said that there's a time for this wisdom. We can grow in the Lord. But the rulers of this age, what rulers is he talking about? Who has power and dominion over the earth at this time? Um, the enemy. Uh, he's talking about demons and he's talking about leaders that are influenced by them. We got some of those running around. We got a bunch of them running around. But he says, don't worry. <laughs> he says, they're going to come to nothing. There's coming a day when the, I politely say, current administration will not be the current administration. Uh, because the Bible says when Jesus Christ prophesied, said the government built his shoulders, he's going to take his rightful place one day, mm -hmm. and he's going to call the shots. Mm -hmm. And so we can, we can have great hope, and we can, we can rejoice in that, that that's going to take place. Look at verse 7. <laughs> but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. Now, if you read that at face value, you may think that there's some things about God that he doesn't want us to know. That they were hidden. They're a mystery. What's he talking about? He's talking about the mystery of the gospel. You have to understand, Paul was writing to a group of believers. The early church was in its infancy. And there were some things in the New Testament that were taught, some wisdom in the New Testament that was given that wasn't found in the Old Testament. Paul wanted them to know that, that at the foot of the cross, when we get born again, that Jews and the Greeks are all one in Jesus Christ. That, that they were all one in Jesus Christ. Old Testament talked about the nation of Israel, the Jewish people and all that God had promised and had in store for them. But now all of a sudden in the New Testament, since Messiah came, salvation was made available to the Greeks, the Jews, to everyone. And all of them are one. That was a mystery to the Jews. They didn't understand that because they never heard that before. And then he goes on, he's, he talked about how, how the rapture of the church, how Jesus is coming back for his faithful followers. He's coming back. He, uh, that was something that was new, that was a mystery or wisdom that was hidden. We take it for granted because we got the whole book. But here he explained to them that there's some things, there's some mysteries and some things about God and his character that he just hadn't revealed to us yet. We don't have to know all the answers. God does. And he'll reveal those things to us in his perfect time when he's good and ready and he knows that we're good and ready to receive them. And so he explained to them, he said that, that we speak this wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom of God, ordained before the ages. The plan of salvation that God has through his son Jesus Christ was put in place before the foundation of the world. God's plan has been in motion from eternity past. And he knew that there would be a day when all of these things would take place. And he's in total control of it and has been since the very beginning. His plans don't fail. His plan's been working in this world since day one. And he's ordained it, which means he's given it his stamp of approval. I want to be on the side of the things that God has ordained. I don't want to be on the side of the things that God rejects. And that's where we are in our world today. We're at a cultural crossroads. We either stand for Jesus Christ or we fall into the wisdom of men and we fall into the sinful, sinful culture that's all around us. And I, we each have to make that decision for ourselves. But I can tell you, it's for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. We're going to keep preaching. We're going to keep having Bible study. We're going to keep witnessing to people. We're going to keep encouraging people. We're going to keep being the hands and feet of Jesus. I had a preacher one time, he said, I ain't backing up. I ain't shutting up until God calls me up. That's where we should be as children of God. I'm going full bore till the end, until I'm, I see my Lord. It's going to be very soon. I'm excited about that. So he, he said that there's these things that just hadn't been revealed to us. But it says they're for our glory. 
Think about that. The plan of salvation was put in place through the death of Jesus Christ for our glory. Remember, we get justified when we, when we get born again. We have that right relationship with God the Father. We get sanctified as we walk through this world, getting molded into the image of our Savior. One day we're going to be glorified when we get taken up into glory for all eternity. We're going to get to share in His glory for all eternity because of what Jesus did for us. And he said all this plan that God ordained was for our glory. I got emotional thinking about that this week, that everything that's happened, everything that took place in the life of Christ, his death, all of those things were for my glory. They were to benefit me. They were to give me the opportunity to be glorified with him one day. And there's nothing I could ever do to earn that. It's all a free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Man, mm -mm -mm. start preaching in a minute. So, uh, but he says that it's for our glory. And then he goes on in verse 8. He says, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He said they didn't know, so they killed Jesus. Why did they not know? Because their hearts were hardened and they didn't want to know. They knew that if they, if they surrendered to the message of Jesus Christ, that it, they would have to change some things in their life. That hadn't changed. You know, I think about today, it's like, why do the, the leaders make the horrible decisions that they make? Why do they allow pride prom at a church in, Dallas, in Sherman, Texas? Why do those things happen? And, you know, here it says if they had known, they wouldn't have killed Jesus. Think about what that looks like in our world now. If they knew these things, maybe they wouldn't have removed prayer from schools. If they knew these things, maybe they wouldn't have banned the Ten Commandments. If they knew these things, maybe they wouldn't celebrate immorality the way that they do. If they knew these things, maybe they wouldn't champion abortion like they do. If they knew these things, maybe they wouldn't traffic and sexualize our children. But it's just falling off into wickedness. And the solution is found in Jesus Christ. The farther that people get from God, the, the more disgusting and pitiful the world becomes. We have the answer, folks. We have the solution. And it's Jesus. It's Jesus Christ. And Paul's like, look, don't get caught up in the wisdom of the world. It is foolishness and folly, and it will fail. So I, I, I was reminded this week, God put this on my heart for me. Because when I start thinking about what they're doing to children, I get sideways. I can't stand it. You, you know, you, Messing with people is one thing, but don't start messing with kids. And that's what they're all about. They're trying to destroy the children, groom the children, raise the children to be godless, wicked individuals. And that's not what God does. God says, suffer the little children to come unto me. He loves kids. We do too. And we shouldn't allow this garbage to happen to our children. But yet when you have a parent that says, oh, I want them to be culturally acceptable. I'm going to take them to a drag queen story hour. Are you kidding me? Wow. They all need to repent and be born again. You know what? The gospel is, good, is available to them too. They need to know that there's a way they can have that acceptance that they want. It's in a relationship with Jesus Christ. They can, they can have the, the love that they're seeking after in Jesus Christ. And so Paul, he's explaining to me, he's like, look, he said, don't get caught up in all this mess. He said, because if they had known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. And then in verse 9, what do we get for doing this? You know what our reward is? He, tell, he spells it out there in verse 9. But as it is written... I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. You ain't seen nothing like what glory is going to be like. You ain't heard nothing like what glory is going to be like. Your heart hadn't even considered what glory is going to be like for those that love the Lord. He's prepared something so great for us that it, it, everything else we've ever experienced fails in comparison. You know, it's like, oh, you see a beautiful sunset in the mountains. You think, man, that's what heaven's going to be like. Man, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. Everything you could possibly imagine about what you envision paradise to be is based on what you've seen in this world. It's going to be even better, the Bible says it is. That we, we, we can't even comprehend how good it's going to be. And so when we begin to think about and dwell on those things, what does God have in store for me? Man, it makes the foolishness of the world look even that much more ridiculous. It makes, it makes it look like even that much more of, of foolishness. And we shouldn't have anything to do with it because where we're headed is far beyond anything we could ever imagine. So he's explaining. He says, look, how, how, do, we, how do we experience or know that? Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. 
For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Yes, there is a spiritual component to every single thing going on in your life. There's a spiritual component to everything from, from joy, financial blessing, to illness and disease. There's a spiritual component in every part of it. I can promise you God's at work in all of it. And how do we know what God wants us to do? The Bible says right there, He has revealed it to us through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of man except the spirit of the man which is in him. Even so, no one knows the things of God except the Spirit of God. You cannot know the things of God without the Spirit of God. How do we get the Spirit of God? We repent, believe the gospel, get saved. The Holy Spirit comes in and dwells us. Guess what? I got the Spirit of God. That means that when I have to make a decision, the Spirit of God influences me what to do. The Spirit of God tells me, uh, leads me for right and wrong. The Spirit of God guides me in everything I do. The Spirit of God comforts me. The Spirit of God gives me joy. And if I don't have the Spirit of God, I don't have any of those things. That's what the Bible says. And so we can, we can look at people and say, why do they do what they do? We can't expect lost people to act like saved people. They don't have the Holy Spirit of God living in them. How do they get the Holy Spirit of God? They get saved. How do they know? The Bible says uh, that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Paul already said, if you look back a couple of verses, that I came to you demonstrating the Spirit. We're to be demonstrators of the Spirit of God in our life. We're to demonstrate the excellencies of God by the way we handle things. We're to demonstrate the control that the Holy Spirit of God has over us by the way that we react, by the way that we talk, by the way that we respond. That's what Paul is trying to get to them. You want to see the wisdom of God? You should see it lived out in followers of Jesus Christ. We're to be that example to people. Paul was trying to be that example to these Corinthian believers. The Spirit of God is what shows us those things. Look at verse 12. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. That's beautiful. Paul's telling them we can understand and know exactly what we have from God because the Holy Spirit reveals those things to us. That's when we get in those times of darkness and in despair. The Holy Spirit reveals to us the great hope that we have in Jesus Christ. When we get in those times where we're, we're struggling, where life gets hard, we can realize the Holy Spirit reveals to us that Jesus is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. We can realize that, that the things of God and the things that are, are eternal and they're the things that matter. It can help change our focus from trying to be successful in this world and trying to uh, into <coughs> being a kingdom citizen because we're just passing through. But, but God has called us to leave an impact and a mark on the world for the kingdom of God. That is our mission. We were studying at Sunday school this morning. He said, just as the Father has sent me, so I send you. We're to go out and we're to be like Paul. We're not to try to, to, to with fancy talk, convince people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're supposed to see it simply lived out in our lives. Our message is clear. It's him crucified. It's Jesus crucified for my sin. He made a way for all of us to be reunited and reconciled to the Father. That's what's missing. That's why the world is so far off the rails is because they don't have Jesus. Because they don't have what we have. And they look at what we have and you know what? If they were really honest they're jealous. Because they want the peace that we have. They want the hope that we have. They want the strength that we have, the resolve that we have because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what they're searching for. It's up to us to be sure to let them know why we have it. It's because it's a gift from God and because we're walking and serving him. Don't trust in the wisdom of men. It will let you down and disappoint you. But the wisdom of God will never fail. His truth will stand forever. When you see something in the world that doesn't make sense, how does it line up and compare with the word of God? You'll know the answer. Is this something I should be a part of? Is this something I should participate in? The Holy Spirit of God will tell you if you are or not. He'll, he'll let you know 100%, no doubt. And when we become responsive to that, then we can be like Paul. We can set the example. We can show people the love of Christ. And we can have the power of God in our life. That's what we should all want. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for Paul's heart. He wasn't a... a 
smooth-talking salesman, Lord. He was just a man that had his life radically changed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. And God, I just pray that we will live that out in front of others. God, the world and all its foolishness is coming to nothing. But God, the things of your kingdom stand forever. May we focus and dwell on the things that are eternal, the things that matter. Not worried about being accepted by people, but be more concerned about them accepting Jesus Christ. So God, just give us the strength, give us the boldness, give us everything that we need to be who you desire us to be for your glory. God, as we enter this time of invitation, there may be someone in this room today that has never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior. I pray that when that invitation starts that they will come down to the front and, and give their heart and their life to Jesus before it's too late. And God, I pray that we will be examples and witnesses to all the ends of the earth where you put us. Be glorified in this invitation, Father. It's all for you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing hymn number 489. Pass me not. Woo, I don't want the Lord to pass me by. You stand and sing. Respond as we sing. came to church this morning? Amen. 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 Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go out and have a great week. Hey, guess what, kids? Take the day off tomorrow. No school. <laughs> okay? On me. I'll write you a note. So, um, summertime's here. Uh, what a great time. Uh, most of us would get a little more time uh, to do the things around the house we need to do, but it gives us even more time to be a hands and feet of Jesus Christ. So I'm excited about that. Uh, let's go out there and make an impact for the kingdom. The world's crazy. Their wisdom is flawed but Jesus Christ never fails. So let's uh, be in prayer for those that couldn't be here this, this week. We've got a lot of people that are out sick, that are hurting, recovering from surgery, other things. Um, let's be an encouragement to them this week as well. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being in your house today. Thank you for your word. And God, I pray that it will change us as we go out there. God, be with those who couldn't be here today, with Mr. Billy, David, so many others that just need a touch from you. And God, we just pray for, for healing in their lives, strength, Lord. Put a hedge of protection around us. Bless us. Bless our families, Father. We give you glory for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Go in peace.